Welcome to Built to Go, a van live podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Wagg, coming to you from the College of Curiosity. This time it's episode 212, and we're going to talk about some lessons I learned renovating my 1993 Scamp 13 Deluxe recently. I did everything on this thing, and some of it might help you with your rig. We're also going to talk about bidets. Yes, everyone's favorite topic. And we'll have a tale from the road involving pig slime and a product review of a, a little bit of an unusual water pump. We're going to have lots of interesting stuff today. Um, so, folks, I, I have this 1993 scamp that I purchased a couple of years ago, and it was in pretty good shape. You know, it had, as they say, strong bones, and I'd always wanted a scamp. So it came up, and the friend had it and was trying to sell it, and it was a decent price, and I was like, okay, let's do it. So I drove to South Dakota, picked up the scamp, and then it sat. I did an initial walkthrough to figure out what needed to be done, and then I, it just sat for a year, and I didn't touch it. And finally this year, in order to get myself off my butt and actually finish this thing, I decided that I was going to take it to Colorado in June on a trip. Therefore, it has to be done. So that's what I've been doing the last several weekends, and uh, it's just about done now. And I learned a whole lot of stuff about renovating rigs, and I redid all the plumbing, all the electrical, and I just thought I would share some of the stuff I learned with you because it might have an impact on your rigs, and uh, it's just kind of interesting. If, if you've not seen a scamp, I, I, these things are all over the U.S. and Canada, but if you're not in the U.S. and Canada, imagine a big fiberglass egg sitting on two wheels, <laughs> uh, similar to a bowler or a casita. It's a classic fiberglass shell camper where they've got a top and a bottom piece of fiberglass that are bolted together and then sealed with a band. And they're very, very simple. They're a little bit more expensive than you might think. I wouldn't call them low-end campers. Uh, the 13-foot campers now are well over 20 grand, and you can, you can get a 13-foot camper for a lot less than that from other places. But like Airstreams, they have a following, and they hold their value. My 1993 Scamp is actually worth thousands of dollars, whereas a 1993 aluminum trailer or pop-up trailer might not be. So scamps are fun. There's a community, there's lots of support, and the company's still in business so you can get parts, which came in very handy. So let's go through some of the stuff I did. First, let's talk about electrical. Now, the scamp was originally set up to have a lead-acid battery on the tongue, and that's a good place to put it. If you put your battery on the tongue of a trailer, that helps with the tongue weight, because you always want the tongue to be heavier than the rest of the trailer. Trailer, meaning that if you disconnect the trailer, you want it to fall on the tongue side. You never want it to fall on the back side because then it's very difficult to drive. So putting heavy things on the tongue makes sense. So the propane bottle's up there and the battery's up there. And then the battery had wires that ran into the shell and they went to a converter, which is a device that converts 110 volts to 12 volts and also charges the battery. And then from there, the converter served as a distribution panel and went to lights and the fridge, which is a three-way fridge. 12 volts, 110 volts in propane, and that kind of a thing. Interestingly, the water pump in the scamp was manual. It was the kind that you had to, like, pump with your hand. And even though it still worked, I, I took that out because I'm, I'm lazy. <laughs> I, wa I want an electric water pump, but we'll get to that. So the person who owned this before me did some weird stuff, and I'm not exactly sure what was going on, but they had removed everything electrical. Basically, all the 12-volt electrics were gone. The box was there, but there was no battery. And a lot of the wiring was gone, and the converter didn't work at all. So I had to redo it all. Now, me being me, of course, you know I wanted to go lithium. And I had a 200-amp-hour lithium battery that was just sitting around. Quick note on that. This 200-amp-hour lithium battery that I had neglected for a year came right back to life. I hooked it up to a battery charger and the BMS came back to life and now it's cooking perfectly. It's like it's a brand new battery. So another point for lithium batteries is you can neglect them and they will come back. Whereas if you had a lead acid battery, if you don't charge them regularly, they die. And I didn't have that problem. So that was nice. I didn't have to buy a battery. One, one of my things for renovating the scamp was to use leftover stuff that I had. So I had this leftover battery, and I used that. And this will be a theme as we go forward. Now, the lithium battery, I have a 200-amp-hour lithium-time battery in there. 
is much, much bigger than the lead-acid battery that went on the tongue, and due to the rounded shape of the body, I couldn't find a way to put the lithium battery on the tongue where it really should be. And I could put the battery there, but I couldn't find a box for it. Any box that would hold that size battery stuck up too far and interfered with the propane tank. So I decided that I was just going to compensate, and I put the 200 amp hour battery in the back under one of the bench seats. Now, this puts the weight in the wrong place. I'm adding weight behind the wheels of the trailer. That's not what you want, but I have a way to compensate. I did not replace the converter. I feel like converters are old-fashioned. First off, I am primarily a boondocking person. I'm going to use this off-grid most of the time. Second, converters are expensive. They take up a lot of space. They make noise. And I just am not going to use it that much. So instead of having a converter, I just put in a portable 110-volt battery charger that can handle lithium. And that's just going to ride around with me. And if I'm ever in a situation where I'm going to plug in, well, basically, I'm just going to plug in the charger. And that'll keep the battery charged. And then the battery is going to power everything else inside. Now, I did add an inverter. I think an inverter is a luxury for this kind of tiny little camper, but I happen to have the inverter from the ambulance, which is a very high quality, but very old 1000 watt square wave or modified sine wave inverter. So it's a good inverter, uh, but it's modified sine, you know, the thing is, though, I had it. I didn't have to spend any money on it. So I ended up putting it in. If I were going to buy an inverter, I would never buy this one. I would buy a pure sign inverter, and I'd maybe keep it about 1,000 watts. I mean, I don't need anything. I'm not going to have a microwave in here or anything. 1,000 watts is plenty. But I put that in, and, and, it, and it works fine. I also replaced all the electrical outlets with electrical outlets that have USB ports so that when I am using the inverter, I can use those USB ports too. And one of them is a PD port. That stands for power delivery. That gives out a lot of juice so I can charge my laptop with it. Again, if you listen to my older podcasts, you will hear me saying, don't do this. Inverters waste a lot of power, and it's true. But in the case of this scamp, 200 amp hours of battery is actually a lot. I have the power to waste. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Now, how am I charging this thing? Well, I haven't tested this yet, but there is a seven pin connector on the front of the trailer to hook it up to a truck. And if it's wired properly, it should actually charge from the truck as long as it's hooked up. This can be dangerous because if you park for the night and turn the truck off, you might be drawing from the starter battery all night long. So I have some research to do on that. I'm not too worried about it. Worst case is I just unplug it at night. And it's obviously not a profiled charge. It's just going to send voltage. It's not going to, you know, top off my lithium batteries, which is fine. Because on the roof, I have 200 watts of solar. So this is a little interesting. The roof of the scamp has a giant escape hatch. This isn't your 14 by 14 hole that would like be for a Max Air fan. This is 16 by 18. It's a big hole and it pops open and you can actually crawl out, but it takes up an awful lot of the roof. So I was able to fit one 100 watt rigid panel up there perfectly, but I had another one laying around. Again, this is spare parts. I had two extra solar panels. So I put the other one on the back but it actually hangs out. It, it actually hangs off the back and is kind of over the spare tire. So it makes a little like awning <laughs> over the back window. But it doesn't stick out past the spare tire. So I haven't actually made the scamp any longer. So I think it's okay. It looks a little funny, but it, it certainly works well. Now, how did I attach the solar panels to the roof of the scamp? This is interesting. As you may have heard me say, you can't just screw into fiberglass. If you have a fiberglass trailer or a fiberglass top or whatever, if you screw into it, the screw's going to rip out and you're just going to end up with a big hole. Or worse, the screw will hang in there, but then it'll start cracking. All scamps are built with rivets, just like Airstreams. Everything is riveted. Everything that goes through the fiberglass is riveted. So I riveted standard solar panel brackets to the roof and then installed the solar panels, and then I covered each rivet with Cicaflex, so I'm not going to have any worries about leaks. And that should be pretty darn strong, but I am going to check it, especially that one in the back, because the one in the back has a cantilever, and cantilevers put a lot of pressure on things, so I'm going to keep an eye on that. I am not really thrilled with how that came out, honestly, but it does work, and that's of the primary importance. 
So that's pretty much the electrical. The only other thing I did was I, I put in a little fuse block of four different fuse circuits. And I basically run from the battery to that fuse block and then from that fuse block all out throughout the vehicle. All that wiring was already done. I did replace all the lights. They're all LED now. That was not a big deal. And there's plenty of light in there. I'm going to install a couple of fans. And because I switched the lights to LED, the wiring should be enough to handle the fans on the same circuits as the lights. So all I have to do is put the fans near their lights. And one thing about the scamp I thought was interesting, and I would never do this in any build of mine, is that the wiring is just loose. If you open up the cabinets, and it has rooftop cabinets all throughout the inside, the wiring's just in there laying around. You can see the wires and the butt connectors, and it's just, it's ugly, and it looks fragile to me. But that's how Scamp builds them. So that makes it easy to do things like add a fan, but I think it leaves them vulnerable. So what I'm doing is I'm covering all the exposed wires with wire loom, which is that plastic slinky-like stuff that you put wires in, and I'm going to just push them in the back and tidy that up. But that's above and beyond what Scamp does. Scamp, in the you know professional RV manufacturing company, thinks it's fine to just leave the wires hanging out, and I thought that was interesting. I wanted to talk specifically about the water system. This has a, I think it's a 19 gallon freshwater tank, not very big. It used to have a gray water tank, but it's missing. <laughs> the person I bought it from said as they were towing it to their house, something fell off. And I think what fell off was the gray water tank. I mean, I can see the holes on the bottom where it used to be. <laughs> so. I looked at the Scamp website, and I was going to say, I was like, well, maybe I'll just buy the replacement. But it was $360, and I just couldn't bear to spend $360 on something as simple as a gray tank. I mean, it's just going to hold dirty water. It's not that big of a deal. So I decided to make one, and I, I went to the big box store, Menards in my case, and bought two four-foot sections of six-inch sewage pipe. This is the big green PVC pipe. And then I bought an elbow, a cap with a clean out on it, and then a cap that didn't have a clean out on it. So if you can imagine that, starting from one side, you've got a cap with a clean out on it, you've got four feet of this green pipe, you have a 90 degree elbow, four feet of green pipe, and then at the end of that, a sealed cap into which at the low point of the cap, I drilled a hole and put in a faucet bib. And that's the drain. And pff, this is a little bit visual. It's hard to talk about. But I, I bolted that to the bottom of the scamp. And I was able to use the existing hoses on the inside to drain the water into the tank. I actually drilled holes in the pipe for the water and the vent to go in. And I haven't tested it yet. It hangs a little lower than I would like. But I think that's going to be perfectly fine for a gray water tank. And it cost me around $60 rather than 360 and so I went to omnicalculator.com, which is a, it's just a bunch of calculators. And one of the calculators they have is pipe dimensions, and it will tell you things like the volume of pipe, of, of liquid that can be held in a pipe. So I just was conservative. I did eight feet at six inches, and it came out to be about 12 gallons. So I've got 12 gallons of wastewater in there, which is plenty. I think that's going to be fine. So I'll let you know if this thing just falls off or have terrible problems with it, but I think it's going to work fine. Now, as far as the water pump, I did something interesting. There are two kinds of electric water pumps I've talked about. One is the very simple submersible pump where you just attach a hose to it and you drop it in the tank and that's it. It's also called a Westphalia pump because it was the kind of pump that Volkswagen Westphalia camper vans had. Very simple. And that's what I had in my NV200. And then there's the standard RV pressure switch pump which is a diaphragm pump that is in line, meaning you run a hose to one side and then out the other side, and it is always powered, and it turns off when the water system comes up to a certain pressure. What I installed in the scamp was a third type that I mentally thought must exist, but I'd never seen one before, and it's just a 12-volt inline pump. This one doesn't have a pressure switch. All it does is when power is applied to it, it produces water, and then when power is shut off, it stops doing water. That's it. Very inexpensive, very simple, much less likely to fail, 
And I don't have to be as precise in my plumbing because if I have a little leak somewhere, this thing doesn't care. As long as it has no power, there's no water coming out of it. So it's a little bit safer. What I bought was a faucet with an electric switch in it. Now, I'll probably do a product review of that later. But when I turn the water on, the pump comes on and I can adjust the flow and I turn it off and it's off and that's it. And I don't have to worry about it breaking. If some fitting comes loose while I'm riding down the road, this pump isn't going to come on and pump out water, which it can with the pressure switch kind like I have in the ambulance. So that's how I handled the plumbing. I don't have any black water tank at all. I don't have any hot water. I have a cassette toilet that fits into a little cubby and that's how that's handled. And that's basically it. Everything else is cosmetic. And I may talk about some of that in the future, but after a few weekends, I've got, you know, a, pretty much a brand new trailer here with everything I could want. And what's weird about these things is that even though it's only 13 feet long, and it's actually only 10 feet long in the living area, it's big enough that I can stand up in it, and it feels bigger than my ambulance, even though I know it's not. I mean, I have pictures of the scamp next to the ambulance, and the ambulance dwarfs the scamp, but inside it feels bigger. So, uh couple of other quick tips I learned while doing this. If you have greasy marks on your four-way stretch carpet, which is basically what these are covered in, uh, you can get that off with a degreaser. Zep, for example, Zep brand of cleaners makes an orange degreaser spray. That took off that stuff pretty quickly. Also for the bumpers, there's a rear bumper and the tongue. They were old and rusty. Honestly, some black spray paint just mask off what you don't want to get hit with the paint and go wild. And I think that's a good strategy is if you have anything like that, especially true for trailers, you have just these black metal parts that are outside, just bring a can of black spray paint with you and just paint it whenever you need it. Don't bother scraping it down or priming it or anything. Just keep painting it. <laughs> I've done this before. It seems to work fine. <laughs> That's all I'm going to talk about. I've already spent too much time talking about the scamp, but uh, I may have some more tips and tidbits as this trip happens. And I do some more miles in this 1993 Scamp 13 Deluxe. Thank you to all of you members out there who donate every month to buy me a coffee slash built to go to buymeacoffee.com slash built to go. You guys are the reason there are no ads in this podcast, and I am thrilled about that, as I know the listeners are too. So thank you guys very much. If you would like to help out, you can visit buymeacoffee.com slash built to go. That's two T's, not three, not one. And buy me a gallon of diesel, and that will help prevent ads from creeping into the podcast. Van Life News. So, first off, VanFest USA has abandoned plans for a summer in Massachusetts because they cannot find a place to do their event. So, they're hoping to do that next summer. The Northeast is hard. I would really like to see a van life event in the Northeast, but it is just, it's dense. There's a lot of people. There's not a lot of public land. And, I don't know, good luck to them. They did announce, however, that they are going to do van life in Florida next year from February 6th to February 10th. And they're calling it VanFest Liftoff. And it's going to be at the same place it was last year. And I am going to try to go. I'm not going to promise that I'm going to go, but it was a huge event. They're promising over 200 vans there this year. And the, the guy running it is super nice. Everybody was great. It was just a really chill, really nice time. So if you're going to be near Florida next February, this would be a good thing to check out. In the fall of next year, around Halloween, they're looking to do another event, maybe in Utah. It's not announced yet. So if you'd like to learn more about what VanFest is up to, visit VanFestUSA.com. Now, several people have asked me to talk about the new tariffs that have been proposed for Chinese imports. First off, I do not talk about politics or religion on this podcast, and I will not be doing so now, so we're going to ignore any of that. We're just going to talk about the reality. The reality is, China, you know, their low labor costs make it so that they're hard to compete with. You know, for, uh, for the U.S. to compete with China on the price of things, we would have to pay people a lot less, and, well, people don't want to make less. You can see the problem. So... This is going to keep going on as we have this kind of economic war with China. It doesn't matter who's president or anything. This is, this, is a, this is a bipartisan issue. But this could significantly impact van life folks because two of the things specifically singled out 
were solar panels and lithium batteries. Not only that, another thing that was picked on the list was permanent magnets, which is an interesting thing. So rare earth magnets, you know all those those wonderful little magnets we have that are so strong? Those are also on the list. And the part that's not obvious there is that those magnets are in a lot of the things we use. So that could also be a problem. But the reality is, is complicated, <laughs> and it's also a little interesting. First off, solar panels... Most of the ones I get these days come from Vietnam, not China. And I haven't heard anything about tariffs on Vietnam changing. So like rich solar and new power, P-O-W-A, new power, those are Vietnamese solar panels. And they're perfectly fine. I've never had any problems with the solar panels, with the exception of one time with a rich solar panel and they replaced it for free. So I have no problems with them. So solar panels coming from Vietnam... It's an interesting thing, and in how is Vietnam going to react to these tariffs? We don't know, but that's good to know. Batteries, well, you know, people say, oh, Battleborn's made in the U.S. It, well, it's, it's not the batteries, it's the cells the batteries are made out of, and they almost all come from China, so that could be an issue. I would say that given the fairly low price of batteries now, if you are looking for a battery, uh, get it now. Don't wait uh, this is Memorial Day sales are coming up. This would be a really good time to get a battery. And lithium batteries last a really long time. Like I just said in the last segment, I had that 200 amp hour battery that was just sitting around and it's totally fine now. And just so we know what we're talking about here, the tariff on batteries right now, depending, is either 0 or 7.5%. It's going to go up to 25%. So that's a big jump. But that's just the tariff. What that will translate to is like for a $400 battery, it would be an extra $100. Not a little, but not crazy. So in general, we don't know the, how this is going to shake out, but we do know that nothing is going to change regarding tariffs until at least 2026. So you don't have to panic. You've got time. Buy these things when you're ready to buy them. And I wouldn't worry too much about it. I mean... Okay, an extra $100 for a battery, that, that could hurt a bit for sure. But solar panels, you're going to have no problem getting. And the magnets, well, we'll see. We've got one of the nice things about this happening in 2026 is we have lots of time to adjust. And the market will adjust. The market will figure out what's best for itself. <laughs> and then we will suffer the consequences or the benefits, depending on how you look at it. Another interesting bit of news, and this is, this is pie-in-the-sky stuff. According to Motor Trend, Mitsubishi is trying to bring the Delica to the U.S. Now, Mitsubishi used to sell vans in the U.S. I remember in the 80s installing cell phones in Mitsubishi vans. They were funny, boxy little things, and they're basically the same van, the Delica. But Mitsubishi Delicas now are very off-roady. They, they're all four-wheel drive, and they're lifted, and they're really nice, compact, kind of almost like a Jeep, but you can sleep in it. So Mitsubishi Delicas have a huge following. A lot of people will import them after the 25 years are up. You can bring a Japanese vehicle into the U.S. as long as it's 25 years old without paying any tariffs. Uh, and their right-hand drive is the problem. Mitsubishi now is talking about a brand new van that would be a plug-in electric hybrid and have all the off-road capability of their other vans. Again, very pie in the sky, they're just floating this idea. But boy, wouldn't it be nice to have a really off-road capable compact van that we could buy and build out. I would be thrilled. I'll have links to these uh, stories and stuff you can read in the show notes. But that's the news for this week. Tech Talk. <laughs> Let's talk about bidets. If you're from the U.S., there's not a small chance you've never even seen a bidet, and you may not know what it is, but a bidet is a bathroom device for washing your bottom. That's right, folks. Boy bottoms, girl bottoms, whatever's on your bottom that needs washing, there is a bidet to do it. And the bidet is B-I-D-E-T-S, and because of that spelling, you've probably guessed it's a French word, and it's a French word that describes the way you straddle a horse. That's its etymology, and, well, you can kind of see where we're going with this. Anyway, a lot of people love bidets. I encountered them in Asia in a few different places, and 
some of the fancy ones are, are crazy. Like you can get hot water, you can get cold water, you can get a, a hair dryer or a butt dryer in this case. Uh, some of them play music. They play the sound of water. Some of them will even heat the toilet seat itself. I mean, you can go crazy in this department. But for us, it being a little bit more practical, can we have a bidet in a van? And I don't think it's a terrible idea because, you know, we're living in the van. Hygiene is a problem. I mean, we have learned that you don't need to take a shower every day to stay clean. But anything that can help is great. And I definitely think a bidet could help. So how do we install a bidet in our van? Well, the first thing is you have the bidet be part of your toilet. This is a very common thing now. On Amazon, for 20 bucks, you can buy these things that clip onto your toilet seat and they just hook into your cold water line and boom, you've got a bidet. It's only cold water. It won't sing to you, but it is a bidet. And I think those units could work with some van builds. It all depends on what you have for a toilet. Now, for my Winnebago and for my Airstream, I have toilet bowls that use a normal domestic toilet seat, the kind you'd find in a house. I could easily install one of those bidets in either because there's a water line coming right out the back of the toilet and all I would have to do is pipe off of that into the bidet and it would work. So if you've got that kind of a toilet, it's a fairly easy problem. If you've got a cassette toilet, it's a bit more difficult because they do not have standard toilet seats. And in fact, I don't think you could modify one of these. So there is an answer, and it is, it's a two-part answer actually. They make electric and manual portable bidets. These are basically just, imagine a bottle with a wand sticking out of it. And you fill it with water. It can be warm water. You could even have a little bit of gentle soap in there if you wanted. And, well, you make sure the nozzle's pointing where you want it to, and you either turn it on or squeeze it, and voila, you have the bidet effect. And I think these actually make the most sense for van life, rather than in trying to install anything. Now, the electric one, of course, is nice because you can charge it, and you just press the button, and maybe it pulses and stuff like that. But the manual one, it's only $9. It's pretty darn simple. Now, there is a big caveat to using these things. If you have a composting toilet, God, it still seems funny saying it that way, a composting toilet, you may not use a bidet with it because it will get liquid into the part that you don't want liquid to go into. So if you do want to use a bidet and you have a composting toilet, you're going to want to use a bucket or a bowl or put a plastic bag in your composting toilet or something like that. You just have to make sure that liquid doesn't go down there. But possible? Heck yeah! You can absolutely have a bidet in your van, and they're useful for men, they're useful for women in different ways, and they're useful for men, and I think as part of staying clean outdoors, bidets make a lot of sense, and there also might be times where you just want a very concentrated jet of water to clean some part or something, so it might have other uses too. Product review. I thought I would talk a little bit more about that electric pump that I installed in my Scamp, and that's the product review here. It's a it's a Baylight 12 volt DC fresh water pump. This looks like a very small version of what you'd find in most RVs, the pressure switch pump. Except it doesn't have the pressure switch. I mean, that's the important part. Now, it's only $18.85 on Amazon right now. It's very inexpensive, and it's very small, and it's only a gallon per minute, which for a an application like the Scamp is fine. You know, this is, this is not something you're going to use if you have a shower in your van. This is if you have a simple sink and you want water to come out of it. That's it. Now, the advantage to this thing is that it's not submersible. And that is an advantage because in the case of my Scamp, for example, the tank is long. And using a submersible pump in a long tank rather than a deep tank is a problem because the pump has to dangle in there and if it can't touch the water it's not going to let any water out and with a long tank you're going to have a lot of water it can't access with this i just my tank has a port at the bottom i just hook it up to there with a hose and then hook the other end with a hose up to my faucet and that's it now you could literally just install an electrical switch even a dimmer switch if it was robust enough 
and that can control your water. I've seen people do this where they'll just take a piece of copper pipe and put a U on the end of it and put that on the sink, and then they use the electric switch to turn on the pump and the water comes out, and that's it. They don't have a faucet at all. Now, in my case, I bought an electric faucet that has a switch in the knobs. When I turn the knob, power goes to the pump and water comes out and I can control the water level with the knob. I want to test that out more before I do a product review on it, but I will. And I think this actually works really well. So why didn't I go with the pressure pump? And the answer is it's just more complexity and more money. I don't need it for this application. I've only got one faucet and I really would rather have fewer hassles rather than more. So I just thought it made sense in this one case. But if you have an application where you're dealing with multiple faucets and showers, the pressure switch kind probably makes more sense. But uh, maybe not. Heck, you can install a different pump for each faucet if you wanted to with this thing. It's self-priming. It's very, very simple. It came with all the pipe clamps and everything. And it, it's not totally quiet it goes eh, when it's on it's like that but as soon as you turn the water it turns off and you don't have those mysterious bah, 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 sounds in the middle of the night that you can get with the diaphragm pumps so for 19 bucks i think it's a pretty good deal so i have a link in the show notes but it is the bayite that's b-a-y-i-t-e 12 volt dc fresh water pump with hose clamp self-priming sprayer pump heck it's better than a hand pump Tales from the road. Back in the day when I was installing cell phones and two-way radios in vehicles, I got to climb all over all different kinds of vehicles. You know, everything from ambulances to police cars to fire trucks to big rigs to little tiny cars. Uh, more than a dozen or so Lincoln Town cars, which always felt like rolling coffins to me. And sometimes we got big industrial trucks, like uh, more than a few cement mixers. And cement mixers were tricky because a lot of the truck moves. <laughs> you know, it kind of rotates. You have to be careful what you attach wires to. One day we got a truck, uh, a, br a truck we'd never seen before. And it was the end of the day, maybe two o'clock, which was getting close to the end of the day. And this truck rolls in and it fortunately, and I say fortunately, was too tall to fit in the garage. And we had a big, tall garage. We could fit fire engines in there, but we couldn't fit this truck in. It was like a roll-off dumpster truck, except the dumpster was this big octagonal tank. And it was dripping. And it smelled horrible. So he pulled up, and we had him go around back to the parking lot. And I was going to have to install a two-way radio in this truck in the parking lot, which kind of sucks because there's no power out there and you're always running back and forth for parts. But in this case, I was very happy to because otherwise this thing would have dripped this foul, pink, foamy liquid all in our garage and it would have stayed there forever. And so we're like, what the heck is in this tank? And apparently what had happened was this guy had done his route collecting whatever the heck this stuff is and then on his way back to the shop stopped to have a radio installed so the tank was full so i climbed into the cab and predictably everything in there was sticky there was this crust on the floor i mean the poor guys driving this thing is much worse than a trash truck i mean which i've done a number of trash trucks to this thing was horrible but being a big truck, the install was fairly easy. All the parts were easy to get to, and it probably took me about two and a half hours to install the radio. And met the guy. He was uh, a very easygoing guy, and he stuck out his hand <laughs> to shake hands, and I'm covered in whatever all over his truck is, and so's he. So I'm like, okay, what the heck? We shake hands. And he goes off. And as he's just about to drive away, I was like, hey, by the way, what is in your truck that's leaking all over the place? And he yells out and says, ah, it's pig slime. And he drives off. <laughs> now, what the heck is pig slime? Well, I did a little bit of asking around, and I found out that who this company was is they, they basically collect all the parts of the pig that literally nobody wants. And if you're familiar with pig processing, everybody wants every part of it. I mean, the bones were being used to make film and gelatin and 
the skin was used for... I mean, every part of the pig was used, except for this pink, foamy liquid that was like the residue of the rendering process for making things like deviled ham and spam. And this poor guy's job was to collect that stuff. And my job <laughs> was to install a radio in this leaking truck, 90 degrees, high humidity, and it sucked. Hey, it's a dirty job, but somebody has to do it. I really hope he was making a whole lot of money. A place to visit. So ever since I was a kid, I've always wanted to drive through a tree. <laughs> And apparently there are three places in the U.S. where you can still drive through a tree. Now, the trees that you're going to drive through here are redwoods. They're massive, massive trees. And before you're wondering, like, how doesn't this kill the tree? Well, you have to know a little bit about how trees grow. Trees grow from the inside out. So they are growing sideways, basically. They don't grow up. They do get taller. But if, say there's a branch at three feet, that branch is always going to be at three feet. That branch is not going to go up. You, you may see things about people hung a bicycle on a tree and then the tree carried the bicycle up as it grew. That's not how trees grow. Trees grow out. And then in the middle of the tree, the heartwood is actually dead. If you cut a tree down and you look at the log, only the thin layer underneath the bark is alive. All that hard wood stuff that we use to build houses and stuff is actually dead. So with careful cutting, if you have a big enough tree, you can actually cut a hole in the tree and the xylem and phloem that exist in the cambium that's underneath the bark still functions and still feeds the tree, but you can drive through it. These holes are not huge. And of the three, I've only found one that would be big enough for a smallish van. Like, I think an NV200 could fit through here pretty well. I don't know about a high-roof sprinter. In fact, I would doubt it. But if you've always wanted to drive through a tree, the place to do that is by Hopaw Creek in Klamath, or Klamath, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, California which is 21 miles south of Crescent City. The address is 430 California State Route 169, which is also known as Klamath Glen Road. And uh, yeah, there's a tree, a, <laughs> a 785 or so year old tree that's 170 feet tall that you can drive through. This is a paid thing. Last I heard it was five bucks, and there's a little box you put five bucks in, and you drive through the tree. And as many as 60,000 vehicles each year drive through this tree. Now, this is not the most popular of the drive through trees. There's one called the chandelier tree that's more popular, but this one fits the largest vehicles. Therefore, it's the one I'm recommending. It is officially called the Tour Through Tree Park. And uh, I will have a link in the show notes so you can find it. But it's in an area where there's a whole bunch of famous redwoods. So if you want to do a famous redwood tour, this would be a nice way to cap it off. But yes, folks, you can drive your rig through a tree. And I will have a link so that you can find it. Resource recommendation. Hey, remember a long time ago I said I was going to create a website that listed all the van life events and then I didn't because that's how a lot of my projects go. Mostly it was because I couldn't find a way to find the information to begin with. Well, somebody else has done it and um, basically I'm calling this project done because this, pro this thing they've done is good enough. And it's at explorevanx.com. So explorevanx.com. And it's then van hyphen life hyphen gatherings hyphen events. I'll have a link in the show notes. But Explore Van X has a very comprehensive list. They call it the ultimate list of van life events, gatherings, and festivals. And it's got lots of stuff. So, for example, we're heading into June here. Let's see what they have listed for June. There is the Caravan in Natarita, Colorado which is a van life event. There's Randy's Summer 2024 Wanna Camp Together Meetup in Champion, Pennsylvania. There is O24 Nomad Meetup, Gracie and Jack's Adventures Oregon Meetup in Schroeder Park at Grant's Pass, where I got the Winnebago. And then there's the Wind River Rally in Hudson, Wyoming. There's the Flaming Gorge Hop in Rock Springs, Wyoming. There's the Overland Expo PNW, uh, Pacific Northwest, in Redmond, Oregon. And that's all just in June. 
Then, you know, there's a whole bunch more in July and August. I'm not going to read the whole list. But if you are looking for van life events, this link will certainly help you out. It looks like it's pretty complete. It's not completely complete. I, I notice there's some missing. It does have Peace, Love, and Vans and Schoolie Swarm. Oddly, I don't see Van Fest on here, which is a giant gathering. I think that should be on here. Uh, Descend on Bend is on here. School EUP is not on here. So they do have a way to submit events. So if you know of an event, let them know and hopefully they'll add it to the list. But this is the official list of van life gatherings, at least in North America. And it's the one we should support. So I will have a link in the show notes. But if you want to hunt around, it's at explorevanx.com. And I thank those guys for doing this because we really, really needed it. Well, folks, thank you for listening to episode 212. Music, as always, is by Simon Wagg. And if you'd like to get a hold of me, you can find me on our Discord channel, on Facebook, or you can just email me. Remember email? That old-fashioned thing? Yeah, you can email me at jeff at builtogo.com. That's two Ts, not three, not one. And until next time, remember the words of Nelson Henderson, who said... The true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit.